great. Thank you very much. Um, thanks very much to uh, the organizers for inviting me. Um, it's just me standing between you and the end of the conference. You and a beer. <laughs> I shall try and keep you awake. Um, okay, you take, uh, and I was very pleased to be put on last, actually, because I always feel that um, being last gives you carte blanche to be a bit unrigorous. Mm -hmm. um, you take your place in the cinema and the lights go down. The street light, the, the screen lights come up and you see a steam train coming from the right and entering a station. A crowd of Chinese men dressed in coats and hats disembark into the cold and the dark. It's a close shot. The faces of the men fill the screen. A voiceover starts. The war criminals will proceed in orderly fashion to the main waiting room. Now, the film is Bertolucci's The Last Emperor. And being a philosopher, you start to wonder how it is best to understand the fact, how best to understand the fact that you seem to be in a face to face contact with the events. You watch the train came, come in as it came in, and now you're watching the men disembark. You feel some slight anticipation as to what will happen next. People branded as war criminals arriving at lonely stations has some unpleasant precedence. However, you know you are not in a face-to-face -face contact. To be that, you'd need to be on the China-Manchuria border in 1950. The subtitle tells you that. And instead of, as you know, you are sitting in your hometown in a comfortable seat with a large glass of red wine on your right hand. <laughs> Now, Jerry Levinson, one of many to write on this problem, says that any reasonable theory needs to account for this phenomenology. It needs to explain, quote, the immediacy of our involvement in and our extraordinary capacity to be affected emotionally and cognitively by cinema viewing. And I shall call this the participation problem. The problem is taken up by, amongst others, Richard Allen, George Wilson and Greg Curry. I'll put aside Curry's account, as it possibly rightly gives up on a full explanation of the phenom phenomenology in favor of an explanation of the content of the film. But the solutions of Alan, Wilson, and Levinson are worth looking at. So here is Alan, and so this is what he says. Um, oh. The form of illusion, um, Alan, the form of illusion, this is, quote, central to our experience of cinema is one in which, while we know that what we are seeing is only a film, we nevertheless experience that film as a fully realized world. Now, I'm not so much concerned with pinning this view on Alan. He has since clarified, possibly repudiated it. I'm interested in it only as a form of solution, which is, I take it, that we are under the illusion that we're having a face-to-face -face experience of the events in front of us. Now, we do not have to assume that having an illusion of being faced with an X entails having false beliefs that we're faced with an X. We could interpret it as something weaker, such as having an experience which disposes us to believe we are faced with an X, even if that belief is overridden. However, we needn't get into the niceties. The point is that the solution is shaped so as to solve the participation problem. It would explain the immediacy of our involvement in and extraordinary capacity to be affected emotionally and cognitively by cinema viewing. But the view, however, has myriad problems, the details of which need not concern us here. And this leads Levinson to propose a weaker thesis along the same lines, and a similar thesis as proposed by George Wilson. So Le Levinson rather tellingly uh, christens his the participation thesis. Uh, quotes from Levinson, in experiencing such nor much normal narrative film, one standardly and appropriately imagines a that one is seeing the events depicted as if from the implied perspective of a given shot, but without necessarily imagining that one is physically occupying that position. And so also B, that some unspecifiable means makes this possible when physical presence in the scene would be problematic. So this captures much of what Alan was attempting to capture. We are seeing the events unfold in real time, but it ditches the part that leads to problems that we somehow have to imagine we are there. Instead, we have in our minds that we are elsewhere but there's some mechanism connecting us with the unfolding scene. And Wilson talks about the kind of machine found in old Flash Gordon serials, but we could also just think about a series of connecting mirrors. So once again, the details do not concern me. What we have is a purported solution to the, pro to the participation problem. These are, these are solutions to the participation problem. Now, the key point is that the partition, participation problem concerns our engaging with films per se. The example with which I began, The Last Emperor, is non-fiction. However, the problem arises whether we're watching a non-fiction or a fiction, say Star Wars, a documentary, say Dig, which is a documentary about the American band, the Dandy Warhols, uh, films of pop, pop concerts, so Shine a Light, um, film of Rolling Stones concert, or even the television news that arises in all these cases. Okay, hence the puzzle 
Hence, it is a puzzle, and this is baffling, in fact, that when Levinson and Wilson summarize their views, they write as if it applies only to fiction. Okay. So uh, what um, Levinson says, sorry, this is Wilson first. He says, what we rightly imagine of the shots when we watch a movie is that they are naturally iconic shots of the fictional events in question. And it is fictionally indeterminate for us what sort of mechanism caused those naturally iconic shots to be produced and assembled as they are. It may be that what we are thereby intended to imagine is only minimally coherent, but this does nothing to establish that we do not imagine these things as we view fiction films. Okay, and then actually you can put that. And then we have Levinson. I have argued that it is indeed make believe that we see the action. That is, it is appropriate that we so make believe when experiencing at least great stretches of fiction films of the usual sort. Now, one might just put this down to carelessness. Indeed, I think that is the explanation. And I think that such carelessness has largely undermined what we know as the philosophy of fiction for the past 30 years. However, before I can attempt to persuade you of this, I need to pause for a moment to consider, as an aside, basically, various replies that might be given on Wilson and Levinson's behalf. I should stress that these are relevant to the main theme, but it might assuage the anxieties of some to go through them. Now, it might be that Wilson and Levinson have reason to think the participation problem applies only to fiction. The participation thesis, Levinson's solution, is, let us say, that some indeterminate mechanism puts us in contact with the events shown. In the case of fictions, it is some indeterminate mechanism putting us in touch with events that never happened. With non-fictions, the situation is different. It's a determinate mechanism, the apparatus of journalism, putting us in contact with events that did happen. Hence, they might think the explanation in the two cases needs to be different. But if they were to think this, they would be wrong. The participation problem arises because it is as if we, as cinema viewers, experience the events as something like unfolding before our eyes. That is, we experience them as something like happening here or now, here and now, or if not here, at least somewhere to which we have perceptual access. So the problem arises with the events, whether the events are fictional or non-fictional. In neither case are the events happening now in front of our eyes. Well, perhaps so, might argue Levinson and Wilson, but remembering Kendall Walton's transparency thesis, it might be that, say, in live news reports, we are in perceptual contact with events happening now via a determinate mechanism we do not need to imagine. But there are two replies to this. The first actually reveals a problem with the participation thesis. So consider a situation in which I'm in my house in Cambridge watching a live report of Mr. Trump arriving in New York. According to this defense of Levinson and Wilson, this substitutes for what in the fictional case is provided by the participation thesis. I am observing contemporaneous events by some mechanism that puts me in direct perceptual contact. However, the phenomenology of watching the news is generally not the phenomenology of watching a film. I mean, it could be, and I could be persuaded it sometimes is. However, the fact that when seeing is indirect, so if I'm watching the news, the seeing is indirect, it takes away some of the, uh, to use Levinson's words, the immediacy of our involvement. Inasmuch as the participation the thesis also postulates an imagined indirect seeing by some unspecified mechanism, it might also short, fall short of explaining the kind of immediacy that a solution to the participation problem uh, requires. In other words, as a solution to the participation problem, I kind of pre prefer Allen's solution to Levinson and Wilson's, because I think at least Allen solves the problem, however false it might be. At least it you know, tries to solve the problem. It doesn't um, give a kind of an adequate solution to the problem. So the second reply, so, that, so that's the, the first um, reply uh, to Wilson and Levinson about saying uh, there's a difference between the fiction and non-fictional case. The second reply is that the appeal to the transparency thesis will at most explain our watching live broadcasts of actual events. However, that is only a tiny part of nonfiction. We would still need the participation thesis for films that were histories, biographies, and other sorts of documentary. So I conclude then, that's a side, a side over, I conclude then that Wilson and Levinson have been careless. They identified a problem about our engagement with an artistic medium film that has both fictional and non-fictional instances, put forward a solution to that problem, and then unaccountably expressed that solution as applying only to fictional instances of the medium. So this brings me to my claim in this paper. Philosophy has systematically confused two different questions. In a moment, I shall state what I shall call the revisionary thesis. I shall then say a little more about it and give one reason to believe it, and then I'll then defend it against an objection. So let me distinguish two sorts of puzzle. 
There are M puzzles. These are puzzles that arise concerning our engaging with some particular medium, M, for example. So, for example, the participation problem is an M puzzle, okay, it's to do with, with, with uh, engaging with film. And then there are F puzzles. These are puzzles ar that arise from the difference between engaging with an instance of M that is fiction and engaging with an instance of M that is non-fiction. And the revisionary thesis, which I believe, is that most, if not all, the philosophical puzzles in this area are M, are M puzzles. Right? There are few, if any, F puzzles. This applies to any M, film, literature, video games, virtual reality, opera. What goes under the name the philosophy of fiction should really go under the name the philosophy of representation. So an important M puzzle for the medium of cinema is the participation problem. As we have seen, although theorists pose it as an M puzzle, solve it as an M puzzle, and then state their solution as if they've been working on an F puzzle. There's no reason to think that what is an M puzzle for one medium will be an M puzzle for all media. And the participation problem is the M puzzle for theater, virtual reality, to a lesser extent, video games. And it's part of an M puzzle for opera. However, it's not the M puzzle for the written word. So what is the analogous M puzzle for the written word? So what needs, our ex what needs explaining about our reading books? It is surely the puzzle of how we move from the words on the page to the representation of the content in the mind of the reader, incorporating along the way what Richard Gerrick calls P responses, namely emotional responses to the described states of affairs. And once you've sorted that out, we have sorted out most of what it is to interact with the book. So this is an M puzzle, nothing to do with the fiction, non-fiction distinction. Once again, this is an important um, philosophical puzzle. It, it, sorry, once again, this is the important philosophical puzzle in the area. There are few, if any, F puzzles. So let's call the belief as to whether a work uh, is fiction or non-fiction the status belief. Okay. Um, the question at issue is what, if any, psychological role the status belief has in our engaging with the work. If it does have a psychological role, then we'll not be able to explain our engagement with the work without taking it into account, and there will be F puzzles. If it does not have a psychological role, then the status belief will be irrelevant to our explaining our engagement with the work, and there will only be M puzzles. Hence, we can ask ourselves what sort of, I think, amounts to an empirical question. Is it possible fully to engage with the work in the absence of the status belief? To be clear, I mean this question quite generally. By the work, I mean an instance of something in any medium. In short, we can state the revisionary thesis in the following claim. Oops. Uh, for any M, is it possible fully to engage with an instance of that M in the absence of the status belief? Now, of course, our answer to this question will depend on what will count as fully to engage. It will not do to hold that a true belief as to whether the work is fiction or nonfiction is necessary for any engagement to count as full. That would be simply to stipulate the relevance of the status belief into existence. What is needed is a defense of the claim that the status belief has a psychological role in our engagement with works. So take, for example, Thomas de Quincey's essay, Revolt of the Tartars. This is published in a selection of de Quincey's work in the history section. It appears to me at any rate that one can read, understand and appreciate this essay, that is fully engaged with it, ignorant as to whether it is fiction or non-fiction. In fact, at the end, once you've read through it, the editor of the book adds an end note, the vivid pictures of great empires, vast distances, unspeakable horror and misery appeal to de Quincey's imagination, and these, rather than accurate historical research, form the basis of his work, which is essentially imaginative and poetic. Okay. So it turns out actually to be non-fiction. So I'll return to this question. So, sorry, it appears that, to, that one, it appears to me at any rate that one can read, understand, and appreciate the essay that is fully engaged with it, ignorant as to whether it's fiction or nonfiction. If this is so, then at least for this instance, the revisionary thesis is correct. Now, I'll return to this question below. Before that, however, I need to consider an obvious objection. Uh, how is my claim that there are no F puzzles compatible with the fact that recent philosophy seems full of F puzzles. Uh, and here are four. Okay. There's the paradox of fiction. Emotions felt towards fictional objects are problematic. The paradox of tragedy. Voluntary engaging with fictions that are distressing is problematic. The sympathy with the devil puzzle. The emotions we feel towards characters and is imp towards 
uh, yeah, the motion we feel towards characters is in part determined by whether they are fictional or non-fictional. And the puzzle of imaginative resistance, which we got earlier with Sean, we resist imagining certain uh, fictional states of affairs. I should have that. Okay. Now, my concern here is not to argue that the treatments of these apparent puzzles in the literature are confused, although I believe that to be the case. My concern, rather, is to show that they are all M puzzles rather than F puzzles, and that they have a common root in the contrast between what I have called elsewhere confrontations and representations. So consider the difference between being attacked by a lion, that is, the lion is bounding towards you now, okay, you're being attacked by a lion, for God's sake, and engaging with a representation of being attacked by a lion. So you could take the perspective of someone describing being attacked by a lion or see a lion representation bounding towards you in the, bounding towards you in the cinema. So let us call the first a confrontational situ- a confrontation situation and the second a representation situation. Now, in the first situation, the line is here and now. In the second situation, the line is represented as being at another place or another time or in another logical order. Um, or to put it another way, there is no lion at the place and time you are. Now, this fact makes it the case that the mental states generated in the two types of situations have completely different psychological roles. So in the confrontation situation, you believe you're threatened And in the representation situation, you do not believe you're threatened. Uh, In the confrontation situation, it makes sense to act. That is, you're disposed to get further away from the lion. And in the representation situation, it does not, because no action that you can take is going to take you further away from the lion. You don't get further away from a lion by moving away from a representation of a lion. Um, Third bullet point, in the confrontation situation, you fear that very lion that is coming to kill you. In the representation, you do not, as there is no lion. So we can multiply the differences, but these three will be sufficient to generate the puzzles uh, I mentioned earlier. The story we can tell of belief, action and emotion and confrontation situation does not make sense in a representation situation. Okay. Um, So. uh, So we we tell one sort of story on belief, action and emotion in the confrontation situation just doesn't doesn't make any sense if you tell the same story in the representation situation. And that that takes care of um, the paradox of fiction. Okay, there's no reason to think that the story we can tell of our distress at a content happening around us will apply equally to a represented content. I mean, there's just no reason to believe that. And that takes care of the um, paradox of tragedy. Okay, in the confrontation situation, sorry. um, uh, um, And there's no reason to think that the story we tell of the emotion we feel towards people with whom we are confronted will apply towards people for whom, uh, who are represented to us. And that takes care of the sympathy with the devil problem. And there's just simply no reason to think that um, we would have the same emotional reaction to somebody in front of us and he would to a representative character. Um, what about four? So what about imaginative resistance? Well, as Kendall Walton has argued, the literature on four confuses several different puzzles. Uh, and I agree with Walton that only one is of any philosophical interest. Um, and that's what Walton calls, unfortunately, in my view, the fictionality puzzle. And Brian Weatherson, um, we know from Sean, calls the elithic puzzle. And the following, so here's the Alethic puzzle. The following is a truism for creating representational content. For some proposition P and some representation R, P is true in R if P is asserted in R. That's the normal way of making things true in a representation. Now, the puzzle is to make sense of the fact that one of the ways in which this can fail is if P is a false moral proposition or a proposition that falsely claims that an unfunny joke is funny. And there may be, as Sean said, other candidates as well. So this is also grounded in distinction between confrontation and representation. There's a clear sense in which we do not create the content of the former. We don't create the content of our uh, stuff around us, but we need to create the content of the latter. We do create the content of representations and there are rules for doing this, such as the one we're considering. And the puzzle is in making sense of the occasions in which these rules fail. Now, once again, the status of the representation as fictional or non-fictional is just simply irrelevant. The rule applies to both. There's no F puzzle here, there's merely an M puzzle. So let me sum up where we've got to so far. I'm arguing for the revisionary thesis, the claim that there are interesting M puzzles, but few, if any, interesting F puzzles. I have suggested that it's possible to fully engage with the representation while having no beliefs about its status as a fiction or non-fiction. Thus that belief, which I call the status belief, has no psychological role to play in our engaging with the representation. I've also argued that the puzzles in the literature that are claimed to be F puzzles are in fact M puzzles. 
So let us then return to the question as to whether the status belief does or does not have a role in to play in our engaging with representations. And for ease of exposition, I shall focus on the written word, although I think the points I will apply, I will make apply mutatis mutandus to other uh, modes of representation. But first, a word about the category of nonfiction. This is a capacious category encompassing histories, biographies and journalism, but also recipe books, stock market, weather and traffic reports. My concern is with the former, that is, with works that exhibit what John Creason calls the creative treatment of actuality. If my theory covers history, biography, and most journalism, that would satisfy me. It does not need to cover recipes, stock market, weather, and traffic reports. I mean, that it doesn't is interesting, but something that need not delay us on this occasion. Now, Peter Lamarck captures a general mood when he argues that the status belief matters. The stance we take towards a text we believe to be fictional, he says, is different to the stance we take towards a text we believe to be non-fictional. Uh, Lamarck characterizes his view by Holtz, we've heard earlier, characterizes his view by holding that fictional texts are opaque and non-fictional texts are transparent. And the difference is explored in much of his work, but perhaps get its clearest and most worked out expression in his 2014 collection, The Opac Opacity of Narrative. Uh, so this is what uh, Lamarck says about fiction. This stands in a this quote stands in a particularly intimate relation to the manner in which it is presented. Readers are imaginatively involved with the narrative or the subject content. They like to look to find coherence and interest at a broader thematic level. They enjoy and look out for formal qualities of structure and design. And the truth of the content is not part of the value of fiction as fiction. And this is what Lamarck says about nonfiction. These quotes aim to transmit information and, and primarily constrained by getting it right. Although we might attend to quotes, fine writing and stylistic effect, doing so is at best inessential and possibly detrimental to the primary aim. Getting the truth is the telos of nonfiction. Now, Lamarck has expounded on the difference with the metaphor of a window. Reading fiction is like looking at a stained glass window. We do not look through. We allow our attention to dwell on the surface of the window. By contrast, the function of nonfiction is like the function of a plain glass window. It is something that allows us access to the truths of the world. Now, I've argued previously that this view, which I'll call the standard view, is simply wrong. Um, I said we should give up the claim that there are essential differences between reading something as fiction and reading something as nonfiction. But however, I've reined back on this claim. I now think there are, um, at the very least, aesthetic differences. However, before we get there, let's examine what it is, what is at issue. Now, the distinction on which Lamarck relies, or the standard view relies, is, I think, an amalgam of several different claims. And actually, I might have done these claims differently, but these are the, these are, th these are three of the claims, I think, Peter, um, uh, comes up with. So the function of language is uh, the, the function of language is different in fiction to that which it is in nonfiction. The primary motivation for reading fiction is entertainment. The primary uh, motivation for reading nonfiction is to gain truths about the world. And the aesthetic properties we attend to in reading fiction differ from the aesthetic properties to which we attend in reading nonfiction. Um, I'll reject one and one and two and give a qualified endorsement of three. So part of Lamarck's opacity claim is that in nonfiction referring term, so nonfiction referring terms pick out things in the actual world, while in fiction referring terms function opaquely, that is their meaning is not constituted or even partially constituted by those things to which they would refer were the words to occur in nonfiction. So according to Lamarck in the Canterbury Tales, a fiction, um, the term Canterbury does not function to pick out the actual town in Kent, Rather, our attention stays within the narrative. It's not the Kent town that interests us, but Canterbury as represented in Chaucer's tale. And this is surely right. Uh, inasmuch as thought about Canterbury enters our deliberations, it is the Canterbury of the 14th century, a place of pilgrimage with cobbled streets and timber framed houses. Remembering that the University of Kent was founded in 1960, Lamarck is correct when he says, quotes, it does not seem right without suitable qualification, simply to substitute the definite description, the city in Kent with the university for the name Canterbury in the report, Chaucer's Pilgrims went to Canterbury. Um, and Lamarck says, so you can't have um, substitution salva fictionate. Okay, he thinks that's a fiction, fiction, instance of fiction. Um, and that's, I mean, that, that, that just seems, that all seems perfectly correct. But the problem, of course, is that it applies equally to non-fictions. So consider the sentence from a contemporary account, uh, by contemporary, I mean contemporary with a murder, of Thomas a Beckett. So this is an account of the murder of Thomas a Beckett written at the time. These de Brocks made threats by day and stood uh, by night at the walls of the Inns of Canterbury, so as to arrest anyone speaking well of the Archbishop. 
Okay, this time the Canterbury is the Canterbury of the 12th century. Again, uh, that it was to get a university in 1960 has no role in the mind of the reader. Whether or not the representation is fictional is irrelevant. The moral is that those who engage with the representations are concerned with the people or places as represented. And this is just a general truth about representation. That is, if you like, an M puzzle and not an F puzzle. So what about the second claim? Um, the primary motivation for reading fiction is entertainment. The primary aim for reading nonfiction is to gain truths about the world. Um, note first that this is not something on which philosophers are particularly qualified to judge. Uh, the question concerns what motivates people to act in the way that they do and determining this is an empirical matter. It would need to be sorted out by people with clipboards asking questions. However, we can give some general theoretical reflections. So the standard view explains one claim often made about nonfictions, that they should not contain falsehoods. And if the primary motivation for reading nonfictions were to gain truths about the world, we would want to be sure that reading fictions did not result in any false beliefs. And this therefore explains the injunction that they should not contain falsehoods. And um, there's a lovely bit of um, Boswell in the uh, beginning of the life of Johnson, where he says, I have sometimes been obliged to run half over London in order to fix a date correctly, which when I had accomplished, I well knew would obtain me no praise, though a failure would have been to my discredit. OK, so he's speaking for biographers there. You've got to get the stuff right. Uh, nonetheless, I say, so, so, that, so, so the, the standard account, Lamarck's account, that the motivation, people's motivation for reading nonfiction is to gain truths about the world, explains that beautifully. OK, that's, that's fine. But nonetheless, as Kendall Walton points out, the standard view attributes a motivation that is barely comprehensible. This is Walton. Why are we interested in history, in the truth of past occurrences? Events of the remote past especially rarely impinge upon our lives very directly. And the massing of armies for an attack on a fiefdom four centuries ago is much less immediate concern to us now than the east-west arms race or preparations for war among contemporary African tribes or mafia families. To be sure, ancient sieges and other remote events may have had consequences that affect us enormously. The Norman conquest of England did. The point is that our need to know about these events is usually not as pressing as our need to know more about current ones. To, point, to put the point more pithily, why think that someone who picks up a non-fiction book to while away the hours on a long train journey is motivated by a sudden desire to accumulate a set of true propositions concerning, say, the Battle of Minden? And the alternative explanation is that people are motivated to read non-fiction for roughly the same reasons as they're motivated to read fiction to explore a world that is distant from here and now and to lose themselves in the lives and activities of distant others. And at a point to which we will return to appreciate via experience the artistry by which this is done. And there certainly seems to be the motivation attributed by publishers. Now, pick up any work of nonfiction and read what publishers put on the cover so as to motivate people to engage with it. It's never read this book so as to gain truths about the world. But rather, and this is to take a fairly random selection, a magnificent saga of public and private lives, politics and society, peace and war. I was captivated from beginning to end. Immensely reading, immensely enjoyable reading, compelling. It will be enjoyed not only as a portrait of a fascinating personality, but as a picture of British politics in their heyday, etc., etc. Just look at the back of any um, nonfiction. Furthermore, and furthermore, biographers appear to concur. Michael Holroyd, in his preface to his biography of Augustus John, writes... The biographer's prime purpose is to recreate a world into which readers may enter and where interpreting messages from the past, they may experience feelings and thoughts that remain with them after the book is closed. So that people are in general motivated to read nonfiction for the same re reason as they're motiv to, motivated to read fiction raises the question so elegantly answered by the alternative hypothesis. Why are we so concerned that nonfictions are true? Now, and I must admit, I don't really have a good answer to this question. I suspect the answer lies in genre conventions. If we line the genres up side by side, fantasy, uh, science fiction, magic realism, realist fiction, historical fiction, political satire, and so on, each genre has different conventions when it comes to truth telling. A proposition egregiously false of the actual world may well pass unnoticed in science fiction, but be a fault in historical fiction. And nonfiction is the genre in which truth is particularly important. Although, as Stacey Friend reminds us, the genre of nonfiction did not always did not always worry overtly about truth. And this cannot, but this cannot be the full explanation. Conventions are not arbitrary impositions. They'll be governed by reasons. Uh, and Walton actually tries to give some reasons why um, nonfiction is so concerned with truth. He says, 
Uh, past events can be richly illuminating in innumerable ways without themselves constituting grounds for the adoption of new beliefs. They can suggest possibilities, reveal promising lines of thought and experiment, inspire visions of the future, clarify and crystallize thoughts, facilitate the articulation of vague intuitions. So being constrained by truth will give a particular spin or flavor to these prompts for further thought, but as Walton himself realizes, for many, many such pur- for many such purposes, fiction would do just as well as nonfiction. So there's nothing in these prompts that depends on the prompting representations being true. Now, as I say, the question of what motivates people is an empirical issue and thus cannot be settled here. What I've argued is that we should not simply assume that the primary motivation for readers of uh, nonfiction differs from the primary motivation for readers of fiction. It may be that a desire to dwell psychologically in a world removed from one's immediate time and place covers both. Okay, so the third claim uh, was that aesthetic properties we attend to in reading fiction differ from the aesthetic properties to which we attend in reading nonfiction. In contrast with writing on the visual arts, there's not a great deal written on the differential attention needed to pay attention to both the content of narrative and the form of a narrative. The question here is to whether the focus of attention of the reader of fiction differs from the reader of nonfiction. And clearly there'll be a large overlap. The readers of both can attend to the quality of the writing, the narrative arc, the order in which the events are conveyed by the narrative. That is the difference between story and plot, or sometimes called fabula and suzet. The perspective of the narrator, the way the events combine to convey a general theme and so on and so forth. Those are just common. However, there will be, um, as uh, there will be, sorry, However, there will be the way the events combine as to, however, there will be differences, sorry. Writers, whether of fiction or nonfiction, have the task of arranging events in such a way as to make the narrative meaningful. However, there are two constraints on writers of nonfiction that do not apply to writers of fiction. The events and the actual temporal sequence of events are um, given to writers of nonfiction. So Gibbon, in writing The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, could have begun his book however he liked. Uh, but however, he could not represent, say, Constantine as preceding Hadrian. Thus, there are different things to notice in nonfiction and fiction. And this, is not necessar- this does not necessarily make either better or worse aesthetically. They're nonfictions of aesthetic merit and fictions of aesthetic merit. A full account of the difference of critical attention between the reader of nonfiction and the reader of fiction uh, cannot be given here, obviously. Suffice to note that there will be differences, and these differences are aesthetically important. Thus, it would be an, ex- an exaggeration to say there are no F puzzles and that there are only M puzzles, because working out these aesthetic differences are, is solving an F, uh, an F puzzle. So in summary, um, I have argued uh, that uh, philosophers working in this area over the past 30 years have generally been looking in the wrong direction at the difference within any particular medium between fictional instances of the medium and non-fictional instances. The interesting philosophical puzzles generally do not lie there. They lie in the difference between engaging with an instance of that medium and engaging with the world face to face. And I think.